There we are. Hey, everybody. Jeff Salzman here. Welcome to The Daily Evolver. It's Tuesday, November 14th, 2017, and I'm happy to be with you today on Integral Life and Integral Live TV. Uh, and once again, I encourage you, even though our sponsor today is Keurig, that our <laughs> Perennial sponsor is Integral Life, and you ought to consider becoming a member. For $100 a year or $15 a month, you can support an organization that is essential in this integral emergence. So please check it out and consider becoming a member. All right. Well, thank you, Corey, for that introduction. Yeah, man. (laughs) Yeah, it's, uh, you know, we're talking about Judge Roy Moore. And for those of you who don't don't get the joke, uh, Roy Moore had its... Uh, mostly sympathetic uh, interview with Sean Hannity, because Sean Hannity's part of this whole, you know, sort of insurrection with Trump and all of that. And um, and so people were outraged, and they have decided to boycott his advertisers. And one of them is Keurig, who, there's several actually, who decided to stop advertising with Sean Hannity, and Keurig is one of them. So all of a sudden, liberals love Keurig. Keurig. 23 and Me was another company that pulled out, and it makes me wonder if the Hannity fans are going to start trashing their own chromosomes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll just have to see. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so you know, today we want to look at this whole sort of scandal with Judge Roy Moore and see if we can put it in some integral context. And later, I, I want to call out the nattering nabobs of negativity that point to this scandal as a sign of the continued corruption and degradation of our culture when it is the exact opposite. And Mar- Ma- Maureen Dowd and Mike Barnacle, I'll get to you a little bit later. All right. So if, in case you've been in a cave <laughs> or maybe, you know, maybe people overseas don't um, pay attention to the fine scandals in our, um, in our politics. But as you probably know, there's a special election coming up to fill the Senate seat in Alabama. And the Senate seat in Alabama was vacated by Jeff Sessions uh, who, to become attorney general for Trump. And uh, so that leaves a you know, hole in a special election. And of course, Alabama being very conservative uh, and reliably Republican, who they nominate as the Republican nominee is generally seen as a shoe in And this time they have nominated this uh, uh, Judge Roy Moore, who is a, if I put him on the, the altitudes of development, he would be, he's a firebrand traditionalist, if you know what I mean. He's, he's kind of like got a foot in Red Warrior, but, you know, maybe a little more than a foot in the traditional stage. So he's kind of holy in this Old Testament way. And we will see in a minute that that's morally dicey. So he gained national notoriety a few years ago uh, for being twice elected and twice removed from the Alabama <laughs> Supreme Court. Uh, once for commissioning and then refusing to remove this big multi-ton stone monument to the Ten Commandments. And so they took him off for that. Then he was reelected, and and then he was thrown off because he directed his judges to not allow same-sex marriage after the Supreme Court said it was a constitutional right. So they took him off for that. And I think he's also, uh, if, I, if, if I got my information right, he's the last of the birthers who still maintain that um, Barack Obama was born in Kenya. So, in other words, they love him in Alabama. <laughs> but now it's turned out that he has been a bit of a hound dog for teenage girls when he was a district attorney in his 30s. And five women have come out and testified, claimed that uh, he uh, abused them, molested them when they were between the ages of 14 and 16. And he denies it and paints it as a conspiracy to dredge up 40-year-old stories, which is it, it is. These are 40-year-old stories uh, by the Washington elites who don't want him to be in Washington. And if you consider the Washington Post to be the Washington elites, then you know, I say, you go elites. I mean, I think it is just a a beautiful time in journalism to see journalists going after 
uh, information, just shining light everywhere. And it turns out that there's, you know, ever more to see. This is cultural evolution itself. So that's really the part I want to look at. However it goes politically, I guess he's uh, running neck and neck with the Democrat now. He's lost some support, but uh, we'll see. But the cultural and integral lesson is really just unfolding in real time. And so let's look at that. Uh, I think the, it's interesting to start with just this Old Testament culture that still exists in, in our country. And uh, this is Judge Roy Moore and his hardcore supporters, most of whom are evangelical Christians. And just right there, this drives the progressives crazy because it's also these evangelical Christians who are supporting Trump and, you know, this sort of blowback against the cultural hegemony of, um, of the left and actually the economic hegemony of the, of the capitalists. But, um, you know, the progressives see these people as hypocrites. I mean, supporting a Donald Trump, supporting a Judge Roy Moore, you know, these Bible thumpers standing behind a pedophile. Five women, all the details. He's banned from the mall. There's this article in the New Yorker yesterday about how he was banned from the mall because he would come in as a 32-year-old district attorney and pick up teenagers. And, you know, just this whole thing that's self-evident at modernity and particularly post-modernity where older men and teenage girls is just self-evidently wrong. It's creepy and it's disgusting. And we can feel, you know, the, the sort of uh, revulsion in our guts from this sort of thing. But that's not necessarily true in the earlier stages. And, you know, the, the apologists are right. They've been roundly ridiculed uh, in the mainstream media, if there's such a thing anymore. But the people who said, well, you know, King David <laughs> married a 12-year-old when he was 70. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not convincing, you know, to the, to the seculars. And even Mary and Joseph, of course. And I remember as a kid learning the story of Mary and Joseph. And, you know, when I learned that she was like 14 and she was married and he was a grown man, I always remember being a little perplexed by that. But... I was assured that that, that that they never consummated it whenever it got to the point where I was questioning that, that they didn't consummate it. And indeed it was God and all that. So I, I guess I went with that for a while, but you know, the truth is, is that evangelical culture uh, today is actually a long way from this. I mean, you, you'll run into the cults that will marry their girls off, you know, at 14, 15, 16, there's some conservative sex that start them out early but by and large, uh, the evangelicals don't approve of what Roy Moore is accused of. Uh, but that doesn't make them hypocrites. That makes them sinners, you know. And this is just not a problem for Christians. It's, it's fundamental to the uh, central promise of Christianity that, you know, starts with the assumption that we're in a fallen world and we are sinners and there's no way that we can't be sinners. That's just the nature of being human, except for the one perfect human, Jesus. And that we are forgiven. And th that, that forgiveness is given and mediated by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so our job is to do the best we can. And when we fall short, as we inevitably do, we ask for forgiveness, and it is granted to us by grace. And so for Judge Roy Moore, uh, apparently the best he could do uh, one day 40-some years ago was wrestle with a 16-year-old girl and push her face into his crotch, and when she breaks away, threaten her into silence. Now, I doubt he felt good about that, and he may have prayed for forgiveness afterward. Uh, Pretty sure he prayed for her to keep their secret. But, you know, the truth is he's been good in the intervening years, these intervening decades. It's certainly good enough for these evangelicals who are all sinners themselves. I mean, at this strata of development, everybody's kind of civilizing their red. You know, that's what, uh, you know, fundamentalist religion is all about is 
organizing us into good and bad and understanding that we're going to be punished or forgiven and so forth. And we just can't get away with stuff that that was, you know, that's the realization of the 10 commandments actually. So, um, you know, that that makes him good enough for them. Doesn't make them hypocrites. It makes them Christians. So that's how they see it. And Trump too, you know, he's, he's has a history, God knows, but he's on the right side now. And, um, and of course, we've all seen him repenting in these videos of him with these religious leaders that he's praying. And I actually think there's some little something that happens for him. I mean, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. I, I, you know, uh, nobody's a complete dead end here, I don't think. But at any rate, a little off topic. So I want to expand our view so that we could sort of see this um, evolution, cultural evolution of, of how we deal with children in general and sexually and so forth. And, you know, I'm not going to dwell on it, but uh, just to move through quickly to sort of the modern state of affairs. Uh, if we look at the early stages, the archaic and tribal stages of development, the sexual code is some version of early and often. Uh, the goal is to maximize the re reproductive capacity of the group. So, you know, women have children as soon as they can, considering the capacity of the group after their last child is weaned and, and sort of on his own. So where that gets dicey by modern standards is when we move into this more complex social strata of what we call the red warrior culture. And this is, you know, the beginning of the patriarchy. I talked about it a couple of weeks ago uh, regarding Harvey Weinstein and, you know, the fall of the patriarchy, as I, as I called it. Uh, but, you know, the, the ethos there is that men dominate and women submit. And that's different than the way we think of oppression in the postmodern world, where, the, you know, the, the women submit involuntarily. Uh, here, the women and men, you know, they have a deal. This is how the culture moves forward. It's, the, there's, it, it, it's based on power. Men are more powerful. Women submit. And this is certainly true for children. And so we have adults dominate, certainly men, and children submit. You know, I'm not much of a yogi, but uh, I do have two favorite poses. One is the corpse pose. I'm very good at that. But the other is the child's pose, where you're on your knees and you're bent over and your forehead is touching the floor and your hands are out in front of you. And when I do that, I always think, this is the child's pose. You know, this is, you know how children were seen and in this era where yoga was developed. And it's true. It is. Uh, so this relationship with children uh, often included sex. It just did and does in these strata, uh, sometimes illicitly and sometimes it's accepted. Uh, sometimes it's a glorified as we see in cultures where they're advanced, but still have red morals like Greece and Rome. Um, you know, there's a beauty to man-boy sex, particularly in Greece, that, um, you know, we still see it today. I mean, there's one of the most popular documentaries on PBS is that one about the boy dancers for the Taliban. And they're, you know, basically sexualized boys who dance and more for these tribal leaders. And it's just part of a long time part of their culture. Um, and we can see just in general that child sex abuse, what we consider, and, and in fact, abuse and violence in general diminishes as cultures develop. This is a theme I hit over and over again. And um, there's a, uh, I'll read something I, I, I wrote a a while back about this. Uh, okay. According to an aggregate analysis of 65 studies over 22 countries, so this is an aggregate analysis, 65 studies over 22 countries, published in the Clinical Psychology Review, the highest rates of child sex abuse occur in Africa, and it's 34.4%. The lowest occurs in Northern Europe, 9.2%, with North America and Asia falling in between. And again, this correlates with cultural development. And interestingly, some of the highest rates reported are in countries like South Africa and India, 
which have this, um, they sort of have a bifurcated culture where they have a strong pre-modern population that accommodates such behavior. And then a modern population that is appalled by it and notices it and reports it and prosecutes it. And that's an interesting stage of development as, as countries move into modernity. And traditionalism uh, carries forth some of this. You know, the, we have the idea that children should be seen and not heard. And, and that when a baby's born in traditional cultures, uh, they're often married off right away. You know, that's, that's just part of how the culture organizes itself. And uh, you, you get these sort of crazy things like Roy Moore saying, well, you know, I never dated a teenage girl without the permission of their mothers, you know, and that's supposed to make it okay because children are subject to their parents. But that changes uh, as we move into modernity. And really the whole idea of childhood is a modern invention. Uh, I, I, I heard it put one time in a way that I, it really stuck with me. Uh, and it's the idea that modernists think that adults should be interested in children. And of course, that's what we all think now. I mean, we study children. We're so interested in children. We, we, we try to give them all the opportunities. We school them everything. But in pre-modern cultures, the idea was that children should be interested in adults. And they were because they were adults as early as they could possibly be in terms of being worked and in terms of contributing. And, um, you know, we had this, uh, certainly in uh, traditional cultures, children were a economic benefit. That's why you had as many as you could, because they would work the farm or hunt or whatever, you know, needed, and, and also take care of you when you're old. Uh, as we move into modernity, children are an economic liability. And so, you know, birth rates shrink. Uh, but, you know, there's that whole sort of stage where the Victorians really started this idea of a glorified childhood, at least in the West. And, uh, you know, this tableau of the family and so forth and started educating at least the aristocratic kids and so forth. But the whole time that's happening, there are sweatshops and, you know, we didn't we were working kids in the mines in the United States till 1938. You know, we've seen these pictures of these kids and, and, you know, coming out of the mines of West Virginia. And that was outlawed. Uh, and that's just what modernity does. It outlaws child labor. Uh, still pockets uh, persist. There's an article actually in today's Boulder newspaper. Uh, Court hears child labor case tied to polygamous tr uh, group. So this is, you know, happening right now in front of us. It's lawyers for a Utah contractor with ties to a polygamous group appeared in court Monday to challenge a judge's finding that the company put nearly 200 children to work picking pecans for long hours in the cold without pay. Uh, and their, their lawyer argued that um, these children, some as young as six, were volunteering with their families to pick up fallen nuts for the needy. Uh, he added that the children looked forward to the break from homeschooling and that this kind of work had been going on for decades in the polygamous sect like theirs. And it didn't really sway the judge who ordered them to pay $200,000 to these kids. So, you know, cultural progress. So let's see. So, yeah, so, so childhood as a concept comes into being as a cultural emergent. And then adolescence, you know, once child labor is outlawed that, and, and we have public school and all kids get to be educated, that's a whole new stage of life that is delineated and it, it comes to exist. And now if you get married at 14, 15, it's starting to look weird. I mean, you wait till you're 19 or 20, you know. Uh, and now, of course, as we are in solidly in modernity and, and post-modernity, there's a new stage of life that is coming online that we all recognize one way or the other. And that's this sort of young adult stage, this experimental explorational stage from, you know, 18, 19 to 26, 27. And for some of us, even later, <laughs> where you're not really expected to get into gear yet. 
you know, and, and, you know, you're supposed to be out there exploring and, and we sort of recognize this and, and that's fine for people. 27, 28 starts to start looking suspect and it's time to get into gear, but this too is a new stage of development and it's, you know, terrific moral progress. Uh, not the least because these kids are going to live to be 150. So, you know, why not uh, do that? So, uh, so the critic critique now is that children are bubble wrapped is that they're too precious. And there's sort of a backlash to that with the free range kids movement, which uh, <laughs> sort of subscribes to my mother's parenting strategy of what are you doing in the house? Get outside. Yeah. So it worked. <laughs> I lived. Um, but, uh, you know, God forbid that people should see any progress in this. And, and so, you know, I point out just the sort of reflexive. Um, well, I'll, I'll play something from uh, Mike Barnacle. Uh, hang on here. He's on Morning Joe, and he's he's sort of the voice of a sort of moralistic modernity, post-modernity. He's got some Roman Catholic in there, but he definitely thinks that the world is going to hell and that it's just awful. And so let me press the right buttons here. So I go to share screen, and I go to... And share the computer audio. Computer audio. Yep. And I think I go to um, this and share a screen. And it's. Yeah. You know, if, just, if you have kids, just look at your children, man. I mean, it's just. Well, then, and, you know, there's obviously such a larger issue here with everything that's gone on recently. Over the past few years, I mean, you can almost hear the nuts and bolts of the understructure of our culture loosening mm -hmm. uh, as everything becomes more permissible, everything becomes more public, and the longer it's public, it becomes, in an odd way, sort of acceptable. And how is it you possible that we it? get to... Ay, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, look, uh, I hear that and I think, are you kidding me? I mean, it's it's the exact opposite. It, it, it are more men groping going to grope women after the Harvey Weinstein incident? Are we going to have more guys, thirty-two year old guys, going after uh, mid-teen girls because of this? You know, and it's just nonsense. Um, there's another sort of angle that people come at. Uh, that's, I think, a little higher on the stage of development. It's kind of a uh, full-on green that uh, I, I get from Maureen Dowd. And it's uh, she just has a snark. Snark is really an irony, that whole thing of you can't take everything seriously. Everything is hopelessly corrupt. Humanity is irredeemable. We're a cancer on the planet. It's sort of a basic feeling. And, um, and she wrote a column when there was uh, a, a new development in this Jerry Sandusky situation, if you remember that one a couple of years ago, where Jerry Sandusky was kind of the right-hand guy to Joe Paterno, who is the you know legendary coach of the Penn State football franchise. And, um, and he was caught uh, molesting boys in the shower. And it turns out that he had had a whole long history of that which a lot of people sort of knew and slash suspected and sort of complained, but didn't do anything. And Joe Paterno didn't do anything. And, um, and, and here's what she says about it. She said, with formerly hallowed institutions and icons sinking into a moral dystopia all around us, has our sense of right and wrong grown more malleable? Uh, have our materialism, narcissism, and cynicism about the institutions knitting society, schools, sports, religion, politics, banking, dulled our sense of right and wrong? And then she quotes this guy. She says, most, America's most Americans can 
Quote, most Americans continue to think of their lives in moral terms. They want to live good lives, says James Davison Hunter, a professor of religion, culture, and social theory at the University of Virginia, and the author of The Death of Character. Ay, ay, ay. Anyway, she's still quoted. This, this is her writing. And she's quoting him. But they are more uncertain about what the nature of good is. We know more, and as a consequence, we no longer trust the authority of traditional institutions who used to be carriers of moral ideals. Well, yes, institutions can be carriers of moral ideals, but our, our own character is the car carrier of moral ideals, which continues to develop. And this is in the interior. This is in the left-hand quadrants, which postmodernists don't, you know, see. They see everything as, you know, as some sort of play of power. And, you know, when he says that we no longer trust the authority of traditional institutions, uh, that's true uh, in a way, in a, in a good way. What, what's decaying is our blind trust in institutions and in powerful people. You know, this vaunted institution of Penn State football with Paterno as God and Jerry Sandusky at his right hand, it's precisely that kind of deification that blinded people to what was going on in the showers. Is it a bad thing that this is knocked off its pedestal? No. And she continues to quote him. She says, and this is him, we used to experience morality as imperatives. The consequences of not doing the right thing were not only social, but deeply emotional and psychological. We couldn't bear to live with ourselves. Now we experience morality more as a choice that we could always change as circumstances call for it. We tend to personalize our ideals, and what you end up with is a nation of ethical free agents. You know, and again, like all the new free agents are who are going to feel free to molest teenagers or grab women at the workplace. Um, it's just crazy. And I'll read what I wrote in my critique uh, a couple of years ago, whenever it was. And this is about Maureen Dowd. He said, I, I say, as I've said before, my beef with Maureen Dowd is not simply that she is wrong, wrong, wrong but that she is demoralizing to the very people at the leading edge of culture who are most able to think and act in fresh ways that might actually be helpful, including friends of mine who pass her columns around as a sad justification for their malaise. Stop that, people. Imagine what we could do if we felt we had a chance, that history was bending in our direction, and we could get excited about progress without feeling like dupes. All right. Well, that's my story today and I'm sticking with it. So thank you so much. And we'll see how this um, Roy uh, Moore uh, story unfolds. But we are having moral lessons uh, given to us in real time here. And everybody pretty much is paying close attention and, um, you know, moral development continues. Mm -hmm. Hey, Corey. Hey, my man. Any, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I got a few reflections to share. Um, you know, I, 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 I always appreciate your optimism. And I always appreciate your ability to cast some of these challenging stories in sort of a wider fisheye lens that we can use to see sort of that larger arc that we're all following. And it is right. a march towards increasing goodness and, you know, more moral, more true, more beautiful. Um, however, you know, as we often discuss, when you start zooming in, <laughs> those sort of smaller arcs can be a little bit more turbulent. And there's a lot more peaks and there's a lot more valleys. And I think that this, this story is clearly a valley that is in service of a higher peak. So I would be a lot more concerned, like Maureen Dowd is, about our sort of imminent moral decay if we weren't actually seeing an immune response to these. Well, stories. that's the whole point. Right. You know, I mean, what he did is no longer acceptable. This is 40 years ago. That's right. You know, I mean, there are still people doing it. 
but you wouldn't find the district attorney doing this today and getting away with it. I don't think even in Alabama. Well, and I think this is where the story gets a little more complicated and maybe a little bit more interesting because I, I do think it's fair to talk about a moral decay. I just think it's inappropriate to apply that moral decay to everyone in this country, to the entire population. I think that, you know, before the show, I was joking with you that when, you know, Bush was in office, I was like, oh, so this is, this is the new low of the GOP, right? And a few years later, here comes Palin. It's like, oh, this is, okay, we've bottomed out now. We're not getting any lower than Sarah Palin. Then Donald Trump. Okay, there's no lower than Donald Trump. Oh, okay, there's a senator body slamming a reporter now. All right, that's the low. Oh, okay, now we've got a pedophile in the running for, for a Senate seat. You know, and the joke I made to you is five years from now, we're going to be talking about how the GOP is defending a cannibal necrophiliac, <laughs> right? So there, the point being, 30 years ago, Roy Moore, no Republican would have touched him, right? So I think what Roy Moore, Roy Moore is actually symptomatic of is an increasing desperation among the political right. Um, I think that this is ultimately good news. It's bad news in the short term because what we desperately need right now are two minimally world-centric parties in, you know, in opposition, but in a fruitful opposition with each other. Well, we need two uh, world-centric parties that include uh, ethnocentric people. Absolutely. And, ethno no, absolutely. you know, I mean, there's a couple of things you just mentioned there and I would... Um, you know, tease it apart a little bit. Yeah. Uh, the uh, Sarah Palin uh, and he, even Donald Trump represent a expansion of the political playing field. These people were there. Mm -hmm. They just didn't have a spokesman. They were just invisible to the political scene. It's actually progress that they are brought in. Now, the idea of Trump becoming president, the, you know, the, the eddies and flow of history are, you know, the Lord works in mysterious ways. That's right. But, um, but that's different than, um, uh, you know, electing a pedophile. Uh, yeah. th these, these people actually represent a, an expansion of, of politics to people who, yes, they think more simplistically, but they're there and they yeah. get to be there. Yeah, I don't disagree. And this is, in a large part, what the Internet has done, because the Internet has been a great equalizer for all of our voices to right. where... If Ken Wilber is in conversation with someone on Facebook, you have no sense of depth behind that little avatar. All you know is some guy named Ken is talking to some guy named whatever that guy's named. And there's no, you know, that's what Web 2.0 does is it flattens everything. So you really don't get, get a sense of, and that's, that's, that's where our trust begins to erode our trust in these institutions our trust in the media begins to erode you know we had one commenter who well uh, let me let me just say about eroding trust eroding trust is progress in I a mean, sense you know we used to ha well yes uh but you know we used to trust the 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 popes we used to trust the king we used to the trust priest. you know the 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 priests we used right. to trust and it actually as ugly as it is to sort of let go. I could feel sort of my traditional, oh, you know, you mean those guys weren't so great after all? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it does feel like a degradation would actually, it as a continual installing of moral sensibility in my own self. Mm -hmm. and, and in the actual activity of the culture, instead of, you know, the, the, these abstractions that we, used to think were uh, infallible. Right. Yeah, I don't disagree. Uh, so long as it doesn't run into complete political nihilism, which I think is, is you know, we <clears throat> have an element of that. I remember watching the, uh, the, the Vice report on uh, fake news. It was actually a really interesting uh, program. And, you know, they were actually uh, look, talking to some experts who take, took a look at Twitter activity during the election. And I think you've talked about this before. And what you had is, you know, you could see everything was sort of mapped out and it was, it was basically who was talking to who, right? And over here in the left side of the chart, which is maybe you're right, I don't know how stage left and stage right works in this camera, but uh, on the left side of the chart, there was 
sort of mainstream journalism uh, and really about 80% of the people on Twitter were all clustered over here and all interconnected in various ways. And, you know, there were offshoots and there were niches and all that, but they were all tied into the general flow of, of information. And then over here was this sort of like massive splintered group who were only talking to themselves had no connective tissue really at all uh, joining them with the rest of sort of the discourse that's happening online. Right. Now, this is the first time in, you know, at, at least since the media age began where we've had this level of balkanization of perspective and of worldviews. And, you know, it was really fed clearly by um, lots of money in various media properties that are all trying to secure their you know, niche audience. Right. And this, you know, we're, we're seeing this right now in Alabama. We had, uh, you know, one of our listeners commented, uh, everyone in Alabama does not support Roy Moore. Uh, Doug Jones is perhaps having a challenging time in his race against Moore, but it's not over till December 12th. There are those of us who support Jones for his character and his record as a Democrat, who at least does have some integrity. Awesome, John. I totally agree. And I think right that on. anyone in Alabama who actually believes these stories about Roy Moore, they don't support him either, whether they're liberal or conservative. The problem that we're having is, you know, there was a, there was a report afterwards that said 37% of the evangelicals in Alabama are more likely to vote for Moore after all of this came out. Now, that's not because, you know, liberals are trying to spin that as, oh, that's because they support pedophilia. That's not because they support pedophilia. It's because they have an inherent distrust of everything that you're saying. So if you're the one to tell them that Roy Moore is a pedophile, oh, that's all just fake news. And as we know, Steve Bannon himself is sending in, Breitbart is sending in, uh, you know, teams of investigators to discredit, uh, you know, the accusers in this case, just to keep fueling that fire. So it is a very cynical ploy, I think, that has become a lot easier to do in today's media landscape to say, no, don't believe any of that. We, we've got the gospel for you over here. Don't, you know, disre and, and they're actually creating antibodies to any information that's coming from that more connected, you know, those more connected nodes of that Twitter chart I was talking about earlier. And this is a problem. Now, here's the thing. There's good news in this, too. I continue to believe that the Republican Party is going to be the first party to hit integral, whatever that means. And th the main reason for that is we exist in a political system that's, that's not a vacuum. You know, I always hear people online saying we should just start a third party. Well, that you, you, you literally can't, right? Because we have a system in the lower right quadrant that's known as first past the post voting that requires such broad coalition building and all that, that we're sort of, until we change how that lower right quadrant works, we're sort of locked into a two party system. And that's, there's an inevitability to that. And I don't see that, you know, that's going to require a constitutional amendment to change. I don't see that changing anytime soon. So what's going to happen is there's always going to be an opposition party for, for the left. And right now the right, and we've been hearing about this for a while now, how, you know, they're demographically fading, um, how, you know, sort of the more socially regressive views are getting selected out of our culture and that puts them into, you know, that brings them the type of desperation that I'm that I'm seeing in the party currently just to remain viable and just to, you know, be able to have some sort of access to power. Now, I think that the Republican Party is inevitably headed towards a massive legitimacy crisis. And stories like this are, are accelerating that path. Same with, you know, all the Russian stuff with Trump and all that. It's sending the party on a massive legitimacy crisis. And after they hit that crisis, there's only going to be really one path allowed to them. And that's going to be to figure out how to speak across multiple values. I feel like that's, that's the only place the Republican Party is going to have to go. And in 30 years from now, you know, my daughter might be a proud integral Republican because of what we're going through right now. I don't think the liberals are going to do that. I think we're going to see some integral individuals coming through the liberal party, but the liberal party itself, like green postmodernity is still so new. I mean, that, that groove is still being laid down in a certain kind of sense. It's still wobbly. So therefore, you know, I think the American left as a political party still has a vested interest in defending green and helping it 
continue to come online, hopefully in a more healthy way than we've seen recently, um, which I think is going to give the, the Republican Party a lot of opportunities. And, you know, I don't see it happening until 20 years from now. But I do think stories like this Roy Moore scandal are, are, are going to accelerate that path. Right on. I agree. All right. Anything else? I got a thousand other things to say, but I'm, <laughs> I'm content right now. All right, cool. All right, gang. Well, thanks for listening. And we'll see you back here tomorrow at the Daily Evolver. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye.